Hello everyone, my name is Daria, welcome back to my channel. And in today's video, I plan on telling you all about the books that I read in January. The first thing that I read and finished in January was Fun Home by Alison Bechtel. Some of you may recognize this author because of her last name and her invention of the Bechtel test. It's a measurement for film and TV and other sources of media, and the stipulation is that two female characters must talk with one another on screen about anything other than a man. I'm sure that there is much more to the test than that, but that is kind of the popularized definition of it. This graphic novel is actually the author's memoir, and she focuses a lot on her relationship with her father. There's a lot of questions surrounding his death, whether or not it was accidental or if he killed himself. The story is also about Bechtel discovering her sexuality and her identity as a lesbian, and we watch her grapple and grieve her father's death, especially in the wake of finding out that he too himself was gay. This book definitely took me a while to get through because the subject matter was so heavy. Also, with many graphic novels that I've read in the past, the majority of the page space is taken up by the art. But in this comic, it was the dialogue and the words that really took center stage. Bechtel definitely approached this story with a kind of retrospective lens. We see her look back on her childhood and constantly question the things that he said or did and wonder about his life. It definitely sort of made me consider my own parents and how now that I'm older, I'm seeing them more as like human beings rather than just my parents. After finishing Fun Home, something very exciting happened. I, much like everybody else on the planet, became absolutely obsessed with Bridgerton. And after rewatching the first season three times in a row, I felt this hunger for new Bridgerton content, and so I thought, let me just go ahead and dive into the books. They're right there. But I didn't really want to read the first book. As I'm sure many of you know, there is a certain problematic, very icky scene in the show that I just didn't really like and didn't want to read in the book at all. So I skipped it, and I have no qualms about that. Instead, I moved very steadily along to the second book, The Viscount Who Loved Me. As I mentioned, this is the second Bridgerton book, and it follows the eldest Bridgerton sibling, Antony. Now, Antony's life, his experiences, his choices, are very much colored by the fact that he lost his father so young. Not only was it very hard for him to lose his father at such a young age, 18 years old, it was also really traumatic the way that he died. His father was stung by a bee and died due to an allergic reaction. It sounds silly, and to many of us it might be, but this greatly, greatly affected Antony. He has a terrible, horrible fear of bees, and he's kind of gotten it into his own head that he will not outlive his father. So every choice that he makes in his life is sort of informed by this idea that he's not going to live past 38 years old. And that belief also very much influences his desire for love and marriage. He basically just doesn't want it. He thinks, if I'm going to die by this age, I don't want to fall in love with somebody and cause them that kind of pain. So when he finally puts himself on the marriage market, he is very careful to choose a woman that he knows he won't fall in love with and he decides he's going to marry Edwina Sheffield, who is the diamond of the society season. But unfortunately for him, it's not going to be so easy, because Edwina's older sister Kate is extremely protective and does not think anyone, much less Antony, is worthy of her sister's hand. So now Antony has to do his damnedest job to convince Kate that he will be a good husband. And then, of course, as it always goes, feelings arise between the two of them. And I have to say that the first part of this book did not disappoint. It was hilarious, it was swoon-worthy, it was sexy, but then it kind of went off the rails there. I thought the banter, the teasing, the snarkiness between Antony and Kate was so well done, but when it started to move to more romantic territory, that's when I had an issue. For example, their first kiss. I don't want to spoil it, but the way that it happens just made me a bit uncomfortable. I wasn't a big fan. The way that he spoke to her, the way that he treated her, it was just very callous and rude, and I believe that that kiss just happened far too soon. And the reasons for their marriage, it was very similar to Daphne and Simon in that they were caught in a compromising position by people and and thus they have to get married. The way that it happened was hilarious, but I have to say that from then on, I just didn't really enjoy them together. I just feel like they moved way too quickly from enemies to lovers, and I would have liked to have stayed in that sort of in-between moment where they're friends, they're pining for one another, there's angst. That is really the reason I love enemies to lovers so much, is that in-between phase, and I feel like there just wasn't enough of it in this book. So then I decided to keep chugging along on this Bridgerton train, and I picked up an offer from a gentleman. This book follows Benedict, who is the second eldest Bridgerton brother and sibling. He's sort of the forgotten one, you know, the second brother. He knows that if he messes up, 
up or does what he wants, it's not really gonna reflect too badly on the family. But at the same time, he doesn't really feel as valued. This book is kind of a Cinderella retelling, although it pretty much lifts the plot of Cinderella exactly, so I'm not really sure what the retelling part of it is. Essentially, there is this servant girl named Sophie Beckett. She is the bastard of a gentleman, and one night she decides to go to this ball, which is, of course, a Bridgerton ball. She has the whole evil stepmom with the two evil daughters thing going on, and when she's at this ball, of course, she runs into Benedict. They dance, they kiss, and then she runs away at midnight. After that night, we jump forward a few years. Benedict is still obsessing over this beautiful lady that he met that night. Sophie has left London and is now working somewhere else, and through a manner of circumstances, she and Benedict run into one another again, and Benedict offers her a job at the Bridgerton house. So here's the thing. This book was not good. And I was really not expecting that. I was shocked. Benedict, in the show, has all the makings of an absolute bicon. But in this book, he just sucks. He sucks so bad. The major conflict between Sophie and Benedict and their relationship is that they cannot be together because they are of different classes. And I understand that, okay? I get it. However, the way that Benedict spoke to Sophie, the way that he talked to Sophie about their relationship was absolutely unacceptable. No thank you. At one point in the book, he proposes that she should be his mistress, and that is basically all he gives her. And when she tells him, no, I don't want to be your mistress, I don't want to be anyone's mistress, he basically acts as if that's the best that she's gonna get from him, that that's all she should expect, and that she is ridiculous for wanting anything more. It was just so condescending, so unbelievably offensive, and at that point, I was done. I seriously considered DNFing the book at that point, but I wanted to see it through to the end. I give it two stars, as I rightfully should have. The next and last Bridgerton book that I ended up reading was the one that I was actually most excited for. It was Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. This is Colin and Penelope's book. <sighs> In the show, these two were just everything. I loved them. I loved the potential that they have. In all three previous Bridgerton books, we watched the hero and heroine meet one another and fall in love in real time. However, Colin and Penelope already know so much about each other. They already have history. And so this book is all about them recontextualizing what they already know about each other. For Colin, it's all about discovering things about Penelope that he never knew or that maybe he always knew and now is seeing it in a different light. For Penelope, who has been in love with Colin for so many years, years, this book is about her sort of taking him off that pedestal and falling in love with him as he really is. Also, there's the added element of Lady Whistledown and her true identity. I have to say that the only reason this didn't get like the full four stars I wanted to give it is because of some of my annoyance with other issues they had in their relationship. Colin is a writer and, spoiler alert, Penelope is also one as well. And Colin has a lot of jealous feelings and misplaced anger towards Penelope. And so I wasn't really a fan of some of the things that he said and how he treated her because of that jealousy, but eventually he came around and was super supportive of her and really like backed her up and I absolutely love that. Colin and Penelope, Pollen, cutest ship name ever I must say, they are really the best Bridgerton couple that I read so far. Next, I decided to continue this historical romance binge and read Lord of Scoundrels. This book follows Jessica Trent, whose younger brother is currently wrapped up in the friendship and the influence of the Marquis of Dane. Dane is a notorious individual. He's a womanizer, he's cruel, he doesn't care about anyone but himself. And so Jessica wants to get her brother away from this person. A little bit later on in the story, something happens, which always seems to happen in these historical romance books. Jessica and Dane are caught in a compromising position and are forced to marry one another. As you've heard in this wrap-up alone, that trope comes up a lot in historical romances. But the way that Loretta Chase writes it is definitely different from the way that other authors have, so I wasn't as annoyed by her use of this very common trope. What I was annoyed by and did not like was Dane. The way that it took him so goddamn long to figure out his feelings for her, to understand that she was being truthful when she says that she loves him. He has a lot of past trauma surrounding abandonment, and he constantly believes that other people don't really love him, don't really care for him, don't really want to be around him. So it was understandable that he kept pushing Jessica away, but he just came around way too late, and I was just, I was not enjoying this constant mistreatment of her. And when I read this book, I think I kind of realized that historical romances just aren't really for me. There are some tropes and some historical constraints that are just of the time that they are written in that I just don't like, especially when it pertains to men and women and their relationships and dynamics. These books and these authors definitely try to write their way around this kind of sexism, but 
I just can't do it. I don't like it. I'm not a fan. So at that point, I was pretty sure that historical romances weren't for me, but I wanted to give one last diverse romance a chance. And that was Forbidden by Beverly Jenkins. This book follows Eddie Carmichael, who leaves her life, her sister, and her beloved nieces behind to go to California. It's always been a dream of hers to move out to the West, but while she's on her way out there, she gets taken advantage of and left in the desert by a crook. She's eventually found by a man named Ryan Fontaine, and he is a very prominent figure in the town that he lives in. He takes her in, he sort of helps her get back to her regular health, and then through various circumstances and offers, she ends up staying at this local boarding house, and she even takes up a job cooking for the people there. Now her and Ryan, of course, have growing romantic feelings for one another, but because she is black and he is white, they can't ever publicly be together. But it turns out that Ryan is actually not white. He is a biracial man. Ryan is white passing and he decided to publicly pass as white so that he could help with the advancement of the other black people in the town. I really like this book because it was void of all of those really sexist archetypes that I didn't like in the other books I read. I really liked reading about Ryan's inner turmoil of whether or not he was going to continue to pass for white or whether or not he was going to choose to reveal his real identity so that he could marry Eddie. I think my one biggest complaint was that the ending was way too rushed, a million plot points were coming at you right and left, and all of them were somehow wrapped up neat with a bow in a matter of a few chapters. So next in the month of January, I decided to go on an entire binge of the Witch comic series. I have an entire vlog dedicated to that reading experience, which I will link up above. Disney, in a very smart move, might I add, has been re-releasing these graphic novels in longer formats. And what can I say? It was just an amazing, nostalgic, fun time. The series follows Will, Irma, Tehrani, Cornelia, and Taylin, who are five middle school aged girls who discover that they have magical powers. Each of them controls a different element of nature, water, air, earth, fire, and energy. And it's just about all the magical battles they get up to, the villains they fight, and of course their everyday trials and tribulations of being middle schoolers. The final book I read in January, subsequently the best book that I read in January, was The X Talk by Rachel Lynn Solomon. This book surprised me so much, I was not expecting to love it as much as I did. This book follows Shay Goldstein, who has been working at the same public radio station in Seattle for about 10 years now. She works there as a producer and she and the rest of the team get the bad news that their station isn't doing very well. So in an attempt to revitalize the station and keep them on air, Shay comes up with this idea of a new show called The X Talk. Basically, two exes will be on a show and they will give relationship advice live on air. Shay's boss ends up suggesting that Shay and her work nemesis Dominic Yoon host the show together. Shay is not a big fan of the situation because not only will she have to be working with Dominic, who she finds incredibly irritating, she and Dominic will also have to pretend to have dated to have a relationship history. And then to make matters even more complicated and convoluted, Shay and Dominic start to develop some very real feelings for each other. This setup is familiar, but at the same time very unique. It's got the whole fake dating trope, but now it's like they're fake exes. I also really loved learning about the culture of public radio. A lot of times we would get like little snippets of their show. They had such great banter, such great chemistry. This book was just so much fun. Also, it was hot, 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 hot. I was not expecting the book to get that sexy. Like some of the things that they did together that Dominic said to her while they were doing things together. So there you have it you guys, all the books that I read in the month of January. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Let me know what books you read this month, what were the best reads, what were the disappointing reads. If you want to find me or follow me anywhere else, you can find all of my social media links down below. I love you all very dearly and I look forward to seeing you all in my next video. Bye!